Netherlands. So well, welcome. Well, yeah, I'll let Anne take us off. Welcome everybody to this is the first annual Maker University of uh, the Colleagues of Calligraphy. We are a calligraphy organization based here in um, Minneapolis. And uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have all of you with us here tonight. Um, I'm looking at the attendee list and I'm looking at the people coming in and we have people, you know, when I say from around the world, I mean from around the world. So we are thrilled to have you here. Um, our tech host tonight is Annalise. If you look in the participant list, um, you will see her flagged up there as tech host. If you're having any technical issues, please reach out to Annalise. And uh, she is uh, on the ball and uh, will be delighted to help you with any of your technical issues. Um, I myself, my name is Anne Casey. I am the workshop chair here with the colleagues of calligraphy. And uh, we put together this workshop. This is the 21st century rendition of what we have always done as a guild, which we used to call mini workshops, and we would do them in person. And given the wonders we have with technology, given the diversity of people who become available to us because of technology, we have taken a traditional program and we have reformatted it to the 21st century using Zoom. So tonight we have a keynote speaker that Patricia will be introducing shortly. And then tomorrow we have a full day of programming where we have multiple tracks, or think of them as tables you gathering around. Uh, Zoom calls them breakout rooms. Um, and uh, we have multiple tracks of programming that uh, we are going to be offering. And uh, I'll share with you at the end of the evening uh, a little more about what some of those offerings are because we are very, very excited. So Maker University is sponsored by the Colleagues of Calligraphy. It is our online uh, workshop offering where we ask our members, what have you learned that you would like to share with somebody else? And not everybody wants to present a three hour workshop or a two hour workshop. Um, many of us have knowledge. We have a little bit of skill or a little bit of expertise that we really, really would like to share. And so Maker University serves two purposes. It allows our members and people affiliated with our organization to share bite-sized pieces of knowledge or insight or wisdom or skills or techniques or uh, something about their hobby in a way that we would not otherwise get to know about their passions or their proficiencies. And the other side of it is it gives us a format that our members and people from around the world, as we've now discovered, can join us for an event where they can learn in bite-sized pieces that it's not a two-day workshop of sitting in front of your computer. It's not thousands of dollars with a big conference and air tickets. And it's a diversity of material. So we really do hope you enjoy the format as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. And uh, if you have any questions along the way, message myself or Annalise, our tech host, will be more than happy to help you. Um, if you have any questions about tomorrow's offering, I am going to come back a little later and run you through what is happening tomorrow. And uh, we're just absolutely thrilled that you have chosen to spend Friday night with us. 
We are excited about our program. We are excited to be in community with you. And we look forward to sharing the talents of so many great people tonight and tomorrow. So on that, let me turn it over to Patricia Paoella, who is our treasurer, and she is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you, Anne. I take the baton from you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. As Anne said so well, um, this is uh, exciting to have an inaugural meeting. Um, hopefully, in 20 years, we'll be talking about this night. Uh, but I'm pleased to introduce Nina Tran, who I discovered at the Kern Prince. And I'm so impressed with her program that I thought, you know what, let's have her come and share with us. And um, I'd like to introduce her in this way. Nina Tran lives in sunny Los Angeles, California and is a single mom of three energetic kids. I'm still letting that sink in. She has been teaching calligraphy since 2015 and has taught for the Society for Calligraphy, Coastal Calligraphers Guild, Pacific Scribes, Michigan Association of Calligraphers, the Michigan Association of Calligraphers and the Ohio Ink Spots, Idaho Ink Spots, I'm sorry, Calligraphy Guild of Pittsburgh and the Gentle Penman. She's been invited to teach in Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines, and has taught both in person and online classes at local and international calligraphy events, such as Letters California Style, Calligrapher, The Art of Letters, Calligrafest, and The Conference. She's passionate about teaching her favorite scripts, Copperplate, Spencerian, Gothicize Italic, and Fractor, and equally enthusiastic about learning new ones. During her free time, she enjoys time in nature, reading, journaling, and bookbinding. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this Friday. We sure know how to party, don't we? This is, <laughs> I like do. this is how I like to spend my Friday. Um, I'm very excited to present today, and uh, there's nothing like preparing a presentation uh, to learn more about yourself because you have to piece together this you know because it's I'm living my life every day but when I had when I'm when as I was preparing to tell you the story of my journey I, I learned a lot about myself a lot of things I'd forgotten so I'll go ahead and share my screen oh actually I think I need to be a co-host to share my screen um I'll wait a yeah second. let me do that real quick for you sorry about that no. okay There you go. Now you should be good to go. Thank you. Okay, let's do this. Okay, can everybody see my screen? All right. So welcome everyone to Maker University. This is my first time and I'm super excited. I keep, it's on my journal to, to sign up and I, I just keep putting it off. So I'm going to sign up right after, uh, right after my, my talk today. And if, if I don't, somebody needs to poke me and, and remind me. But I think um, Anne will remind us all at the end. So here we go. Okay, so I, I highly encourage you to participate. And uh, throughout the throughout the presentation, you'll see this little clapper boards. And, you know, I'm going to suggest a response from you. And it's going to hopefully make this a more enjoyable experience. I think it's already going to be pretty awesome, but maybe it'll it'll lighten it up a little bit and, and make it more fun. Okay, so I've already been introduced, but hello again, I'm Nina Tran. I live in Los Angeles. I was born in the Philippines and I came to the United States in 1991 and I just lived in Los Angeles ever since. I haven't really lived anywhere else. So I this is all that I know. I am a calligraphy teacher, and I, as uh, Patricia mentioned, I teach a variety of scripts, and I'll just say them because they're here, including Copperplate, Fractor, Gothicized Italic, Syrian, Monoline Foundational, and Copperplate and Fractor Flourishing. And I think every year I'm just teaching something new, which is kind of exciting for me. And I, I don't normally plan to teach a thing. I'm usually asked to teach something that I don't usually know very well yet. And I always say yes, <laughs> unless it's, I really can't do it, but usually I'll say yes. And then I'll hide away for six months or so, and I'll just 
work really, really hard to study and practice until I can deliver a class. So that's that's usually what happens. But I was not always a calligrapher or a teacher. So let's go back in time. Okay, this is we're practicing the cue thing here. So this is our time to say, oh, <laughs> thank you. I don't even think this is my bike. Uh, it's probably my neighbor's bike. But anyway, all right. So I, I just want to set you up a little bit to how I got to calligraphy in the first place. Um, I, I don't think that I was, I, I didn't know that I was destined to do what I'm doing now, but this is, these are the years that led up to calligraphy. So uh, again, I was born in, in the Philippines in 1984. And sometime when I was ready for school, my grandpa taught me how to draw. And I've always remembered that because he was trying to draw his cousin and he was showing me how to draw her. And he took, you know, a stick um, and he was drawing with a stick. And he just said, okay, her head is a circle and her body is this, you know, this shape and her feet are little triangles. And when he described drawing to me as these basic shapes that were being put together, it's my eyes just sparkled. And suddenly I saw everything as these shapes. So when I would draw mountains, I would see them as triangles. Or when I saw a car, it would be, you know, this rectangle here with circles over here and that really stuck with me. And I don't think I ever got to tell my grandpa how that affected me because I wouldn't really realize that until way later. But um, when I was in middle school, I, I hung out with a bunch of guys who were really into X-Men and Spider-Man and, you know, Marvel comics and um, all sorts of other anime and uh, cartoons. And one of the guys, his name was Mark Reyes, he always carried around a sketchbook. And I, I never saw anybody carry around a sketchbook before. And he always had a pencil and he's always sketching in this little sketchbook. And I was so intrigued about what, what he was doing in there. And he showed it to me and I was, I fell in love with drawing. And it just took me back to my childhood years when I was uh, intrigued by my grandpa's simple drawings and so I took on drawing myself and I actually wanted to be a comic book artist when I grew up and I, I drew for for a long time and so here I'm drawing uh, some X-Men characters as you can see and in 1997 I was exposed to calligraphy for the first time my my dad's my dad's best friend gave me this kit for Christmas and I loved it so much, but after two weeks of writing, I ran out of ink and I, I didn't know that you could buy refills and I, I didn't, I just didn't know that that was a thing. And I thought, well, that was really nice. And then I went back to drawing or something else. Um, and then in 2022, I attended Cal State Northridge and I, I took biology as my undergrad study. And I really wanted to practice art or to learn art, but that was just not, it's just not a thing that, it, it's a, uh, it just wasn't an option, let's just say that. But towards the end of my university years, I took up photography and uh, after that I took up watercolor because I wanted to draw the things that I was taking photos of. And then in 2010, I got married and that same year my daughter was born. This is her, she's Emily. And uh, and it was that was the beginning of the end of my my art endeavors, uh, at least with the pen and ink and and paint and all of those things. But uh, just before my son was born, my niece Allison came to live with me, and she was crocheting, and she taught me how to crochet. And uh, my kids are well, you can see. They're, the sub, they're subjected to my my uh, crocheting and I also took up knitting, but it, these things were all short-lived and I never really got good at them because calligraphy would soon be taking over. Okay, but first, let me tell you very quickly about my quarter life crisis uh, in, towards the end of 2014. So at this time I was a stay-at-home mom 
And I just felt like all my friends were successful in their careers and they had life figured out. And I felt like maybe I was missing something because I was just a stay-at-home mom and I just didn't feel very accomplished. I felt a little lost and like I missed the train or something and I'm left behind and I I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. But then I received a rock. Okay, not this rock. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. But this kind of rock, the Sisyphus kind of rock, the kind of rock that challenges you, the one that you push up the hill every day, the one that you're supposed to climb or dig a hole under or I don't know it was it gave me a new purpose and this rock was calligraphy and this was my metaphoric rock um and when I was reintroduced to calligraphy I just I felt a a new purpose in life I mean I was busy with my kids but I needed something that I could have and do just for me So here's what happened. All right, so I have my college buddy, Maria. She got engaged and she asked me to help her with signage. And she said I had pretty decent handwriting. So thank you, Maria. And so she invited me to to learn modern calligraphy with her so that we could prepare signage for her wedding. And we had about a year to learn this thing. And I said, that is so easy, let's do it. So we are scrolling through Pinterest. And we're looking through all of these different examples. And she said, okay, Nina, I think we need to get some pointed pen thing. And my response was, aren't all pens pointed? And she said, actually, we need to get something like this. So I went to Michael's in December and I was looking for a pointed pen, but I had really no idea which one to buy. So I just bought the cheapest thing, which was this crow quill. And it came in this sort of a pencil, um, pencil like pen holder. And it came with a little nib that looked like this. And then um, I'm jumping a little bit forward, but a month later, I discovered copper plate. So I actually ended up completely abandoning modern calligraphy because I just really couldn't figure it out. But maybe I'm maybe that's a spoiler alert. Okay, so going back to my rock real quick, when your rock comes and it starts rolling, you have two choices. You can either get out of the way and let it go, let it pass, or you can run for your life and run along with it and clear the path and see where that rock will take you. So these were my early rock pushing days. Okay, this was the one of the very first things that I wrote in December when I got my crow quill. And by the end of December, I really had no idea that you had to take care of your pen. I didn't know how to wash the pen. And I didn't know that your pen could break if you didn't take care of it and if you pressed on it too hard. So I ended up buying another croquil (laughs) because I I really had no idea. And you know what? The croquil was working for me. And I thought, wow, this calligraphy thing is so easy. We're going to get these wedding signage done real fast. And this is your time to cringe. So by January, uh, for my birthday, my my friend Maria, she gifted me some new equipment. And I wasn't really sure if the gift was for her because we're working on a wedding or if the gift was for me because it was my birthday, but maybe it was both. Either way, I was really grateful because then I I could try something new. Um, Even though, you know, I think I could have probably continue going on with the crocodile. It wasn't wasn't that bad. But before I can, let's take a little uh, detour and talk a little bit about pen holders. So these are some of the pen holders that I've acquired over the years. And in my defense, I did not buy all of these. A lot of these were gifted to me, um, including this very first pen holder that, that I got. Uh, Aside from the speedball one that I showed you, this one here is from my friend uh, Jodine, and she gave this to me in March 2015, and this was around the time where I was, well, when I accidentally became a teacher, and I'll have to tell you that story 
later on, maybe if, if you're curious about how I accidentally became a teacher. But at that time, I was really doubting this whole rock thing. Maybe I stole somebody else's rock. And why, why, where did this rock even come from? And Jodine, I didn't really know her, but she sent me a pen holder. And this is a pen holder by um, Heather Hell's husband. So it's quite a nice one. And I saw that as a sign that I'm on the right path. And um, so these are some other pen holders that I've acquired. Again, my defense, I didn't buy them all. Um, and they're all different. They're all different lengths. Some of them have a different cut. Some of them have a flare. Some of them are a little bit more sort of straight, like this one here by David Grimes. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different kinds of pen holders. And the pen holder that you choose for yourself really depends on you and your hand and um, how what size you, you want. So some people prefer something more like a carrot. Some people prefer really thin uh, pen holders. So there's people often ask me what pen holder I should, they should use. And I say, you know what, you need to go find a friend who's local and you need to try all of their pen holders and see which one works for you. So oftentimes when I teach a, an in-person class, I bring all of these and I have my students try them out. Okay, nibs. So if you're new to calligraphy, um, there are basically four types of nibs. You have your monoline type of pens. You have your broad edged pens, which are sometimes straight and sometimes they have an oblique cut. Then you have your flexible pointed pens and then you have your brush pens. And in this case, it's just a brush. It's a felt brush, but it could be an actual hair brush. Uh, yeah, so those are the four usual tools that we use for calligraphy. But we were talking about folded pens earlier, so that could also be uh, another kind of tool and that would be categorized in the broad edge or it could be a monoline if you're just using the tip. Okay, so the nibs that we're gonna talk about, not to mistake them for these monoline broad pens, these ones are the speedball speed nibs, which I really enjoy using. Um, the pens or the nibs that I'm talking about, sometimes the nibs are called pen points or steel nibs or dip pens. They have all sorts of different names. And it was really confusing when I was just starting because is it a pen point? Is it a steel nib? What is it? So I'm, I'll just call them nibs. Um, and so the ones that we want are the flexible pointed nibs or pointed pens, because there are pointed pens that are not flexible. And um, something that I learned too late, I learned it when my, my nib broke, as you saw in the picture, but that nibs don't last forever. So sometimes they will wear out. Sometimes they will rust if you don't take care of them or if you live in a place where there's high humidity. Sometimes if you press too hard, the tines, the two points that um, that spread apart and come together when you apply and release pressure, sometimes if it's permanently open, it's time to toss it and get a new one. Or sometimes if you're making an upstroke and it scratches, it's, it's just time to, to replace. Inks, next one. So I started with the Sumi ink. Actually, I started with a fountain pen ink that bled like crazy, but I really didn't know the difference. I didn't know that, I didn't know what feathering was or anything like that. So to me, I thought it was going pretty well, but um, my friend Maria gifted me the Sumi ink, which was what she was using. And I didn't learn until way later that you actually had to dilute this ink, uh, one part Sumi, one part water. So I was uh, going through the Sumi ink pretty fast because I was writing every day. But uh, the, my, second, my second ink choice at that time was the walnut ink. And I really liked writing on black paper. So the bleed proof white became another favorite. And then when you know people who make ink, they give you ink. So I ended up with lots of different inks to try. And, um, but I still really liked these ones only because they were so familiar and also because these were so beautiful. You know, when, when you're new and you get something really pretty, you don't want to wear it or you don't want to use it. So I, I felt a little bit hesitant to try them. And it's only now, uh, well, not now, but within over the last couple of years that I really just let myself 
enjoy these nice things, including gouache. And these are some of the ink holders that, that I have. And this one here, this was before I had um, ink holders and I would just build myself uh, an ink holder to hold my my ink container with Lego because I had tons of those. And uh, just a reminder for those of us who are afraid of making a mess, it's kind of messy. It's just part of the job. You know, it's like having a baby and not expecting it to vomit on you or something. Come on. So uh, this is how things will start out nice and beautiful. And eventually over the years, you'll get stuff on it and eventually you'll end up probably something like this and I think it's it's rather charming to me so whenever I see a, I, I know my I have a friend who cringes every time he sees my ink holders and my ink wells but I do really like it you know I like it when an artist's apron is full of ink splatters and stuff like that you know I like it when the shoes are a little worn I like it when the tennis racket has a little you know it's like somebody's been holding it and been using it I love that and another essential tool is paper. Now, I don't really have a lot of experience with nice papers. For a long time, I was really into Rhodia, but it was probably because it was the only thing that I knew. You know, when you don't know, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. So this is what I was using, and it was the paper that was not bleeding, and I was perfectly fine with that. And then in one class, somebody mentioned Borden and Riley. and I can't recall who mentioned it, but ever since then, I, I use mostly Borden and Riley for, for teaching and for practice. And for my notebooks, I use moleskin notebooks. They bleed a lot, so you can't really use other, you can't really use pens or, sorry, inks with them. I really like this Arteza Premium Sketchbook. It takes ink pretty okay it's not so bad probably the best one is the Fabriano sketch which takes ink very well to my surprise so these are the usual papers that I use for the things that I do with my calligraphy so the basic supplies I mentioned somebody asked earlier if if they're gonna if, if they need supplies and at the end I will do a short demo I think we'll have time to do it so if you if you want to, you can bring out some something to write with, some ink. Uh, you will need some washi tape, and um, you will need probably some paper clips. If you want to take some notes, you can have some colorful pens. I like to use these Sarasa clip ones. You'll need some kind of a pen holder with your favorite nib, and maybe possibly a ruler, eraser. You know, basic stuff that you would use if you're practicing pointed pen. Okay, now that we've got our shopping list out of the way, we can get back to the story. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could use a little bit more enthusiasm in the next one, but it's okay. That was pretty good. Uh, these, this is a sample of my early writing, and I was writing every day. So one thing that you should know about me is that when I get into something, I get into something and I need to know everything about this thing. I need to do it every day. Uh, when I was crocheting, I needed to know, I needed to have every single hook and I needed to know every single kind of yarn and every single color. And if there was a single crochet stitch, then what was a double crochet? And I needed to know all of that stuff. Um, and I, I would get crazy about it. Uh, for me with calligraphy though, it, I didn't, I had that curio curiosity, but not, really, I, I really just wanted to write. I just wanted to write letters. But very quickly, I found out that I was plateauing already. And I just started. I felt like, wow, I'm already so good at this. <laughs> you know, but I feel like there's nothing missing. Um, yeah, that's just the beginner me. I really thought that I it was so easy and I I gotten it. But well, one day, as as those of you who are on social media know, sometimes you you start somewhere on somebody's page and then you click here and you click there and you click there. And next thing you know, you're following this rabbit hole down somewhere and you end up somewhere, somewhere where you had no idea how you got there in the first place. And that's exactly what happened to me on Instagram. I followed the white rabbit 
probably using the hashtag copper plate. And I ended up somehow, probably minutes or hours later, I have no idea, but I ended up at Dr. Gail Madalag's Instagram page. And I got a chance to meet her in 2018. I'm really grateful for that opportunity. But this was in 2015 when I came across her Instagram. And at this time, I don't think there were a whole lot of people. Well, I was just so new. I, I didn't know anybody really. But um, when I saw her, I thought, wow, she's doing this pointed pen thing, but she's doing it a little bit differently than how I'm doing it. And so I started stalking her. <clears throat> I mean, following her, I started following her and watching her videos very carefully. And in one of her posts, she, she mentions this thing called drills or something. And she mentioned something called copper plate. And so I was intrigued. And I was also intrigued by what she was doing. I mean, what is this? this is this writing? You know, I was really curious about what she was doing and how she was so good. And you can take a screenshot of this and read it on your own. I'll just read to you the highlights. So some of the things that stuck out to me on this particular post, in this particular post, were the terms copper plate, drills. Oh, what are, what are drills, right? I was a beginner. I was curious. And she talks about practicing. Hmm. And then she talks about how drills are, are, are sets of fundamentals done over and over again. And she also talks about lengthening patience with, uh, by doing the drills. And she's talking about careful and focused practice. What is she talking about? And then she mentions this Dr. Joe guy. Who, who is that guy? <laughs> you know. So there's this is a loaded page for me. And I, I started following her. And I, I, I asked her directly, wow, you are so good. How can I be like you? I want to be you. How do I do what you're doing? And she said, okay, you need to do drills. And I said, okay. So I did drills. I did them one time, maybe two times. And then I was like, you know, this is not really working. I don't really think this is for me. You know, I really just want to write letters. So I just went back to my old ways. But eventually I went back to the drills because I really wasn't making any progress and I, I really wanted to be like the dog. So I went back and I did it. I did it in January, February, March, April, May. And I just kept doing it. And I would see small progress. For instance, here I started using the lines before my strokes were floating. I didn't really know about baselines or waistlines or anything like that. And I began to establish more rhythm in my strokes. And uh, I, I began to see progress. And I haven't really stopped doing them. I'm still doing them, guys. Uh, let's see, I did them 2006, 97. And then in 2018, I was like, hey, everybody, who wants to do um copper plate drills with me and I set up a free boot camp on Instagram and I was really surprised to see so many people wanting to do them with me and joining them uh, joining me to do them and so I I was really inspired by these people and and to, they themselves saw the results of doing drills so I said wow Dr. Gail really knows what she's talking about. And so I continued to do them. And sometimes I would change them up a little bit. Um, and sometimes I would teach the drills. I teach copper plate boot camp classes now, um, especially after seeing the response and the results of some of the people who were who were following me on, on Instagram. And these are the latest drills. And you're probably wondering, well, have you done any drills this year? And I'm just going to say... Just because there aren't any pictures, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Just saying. Okay, so here's kind of a overview. Here's an overview of my copper plate journey from 2015 to 2021. And this was where I started. And remember, at that time, I thought I was doing great. I thought, wow, this is so easy. I totally got this. And then 
I met Dr. Gail and I learned that I had no idea what the heck I was doing. Um, and I'm happy to say, though, that by the end of 2015, my letters improved. And by 2016, they got a little bit better. And they 17, they improved a little bit more. So it was incremental progress for me. And it took me a long time to, to get to this stage. And by 2018, I started to do a little bit more variation, started to play around with copper plate a little bit more and playing with texture and spacing and all of that good stuff. And last year and this year for me, copper plate wise, I, I really want to explore more of the outer boundaries of copper plate. How far can I take this pointed pen or this copper plate before it's no longer copper plate? And I think on some of these, I, I kind of reached that boundary and touched some touched up on something else. But I, I also like to write copper plate in monoline. So I really enjoy writing with a glass pen. I think it's, it's fun and it feels good and I'm still using ink. So this is where my copper plate is living right now. So it's more of, a, of an experimental style and that's not so much traditional copper plate anymore. All right, so I can't really say that I did it all by myself because I didn't. I had a lot of people helping me push and roll my boulder. And one of those heavy lifters was Dr. Joe. Dr. Joe Vitolis, the Dr. Joe that Dr. Gale was talking about. And as it turns out, Dr. Joe is Dr. Gale's mentor. And so I started talking to him <laughs> in 2015. And I started following him on YouTube and I would watch his tutorials every day. Every day I would repeat. I would watch him do the letter A or the letter B and I would repeat, repeat. And I would watch it while I was washing dishes. I would watch it while I was folding clothes. And I was just watching him, allowing my mirror neurons to, to work. And then by the time I got to my table, I had kind of already sort of memorized it, at least the motions of it. And I could try it for myself but he was really one of my first formal teachers even though he didn't really know it at the time because I was secretly low-key stalking him but eventually um he saw that I kept tagging him on Instagram because that's what stalkers do or sorry uh loyal followers do and he sent me an email and he said hey Nina you seem to be really into this copper plate thing can I critique one of your your works and I said, what? Joey's talking to me. And I said, oh, yes, please. And it took him a few weeks to get back to me. He's a very busy man. But when he emailed me, I, I wish I still had it, but I can't find it for the life of me. And I'm too embarrassed to bother Dr. Joe about it. But when he sent me this email, let's say it was a page like this, it was red all over. He was like, this oval over here is not the same as this oval. And this shade is too thick. And this one's too thin. And this one's off the slant. This one's on the slant. This one's not even touching the baseline. What is going on here? Uh, he was a little bit kinder than, than that. But um, I, I, it, was, it was really eye-opening because I, I felt like, oh my gosh, this is so easy. I've got this. And then to get that feedback from somebody who knows copper plate, like the back of his hand I it was just really eye-opening one to know that wow I really don't know what I'm doing and there's still so much to know so it was kind of a, a good feedback for my ego to, to kind of like tone tone myself down a little because I was really excited and I thought that I had it but I it was it was probably the kindest thing anybody had done for me at that time was to tell me, hey, you're doing great, but you could really still work on this. And he's a he's a great teacher. So I'm really grateful for Dr. Joe. And if you're curious about who he is, you can go to zenarian.com and you could check out his free interactive ebook. Can't say it's as funny as this presentation. I don't think there are uh, little clappers there, but uh, it's it's great. It's a great resource. And and you can also play his videos from there. Okay, two other pillars that helped me or two really strong people to help me push my rock were my friends, Andrew and Judy. And I have no idea how they 
why they reached out to me. I was really the the weakest link, but for whatever reason, in the spring of 2015, they asked me to join their study group. And I at first I was like, study group? What do you what do you what are we studying? And they said, oh, we're studying a grocery script. You know, we're studying this copper plate thing. And I said, okay, not really knowing what that meant. I mean, I studied at a university, studied in school, but I didn't know you could study calligraphy. It sounds a little nerdy, right? Um, but that's what they did. And I, they opened up my eyes to so many things. And not only did we study together, we studied the same thing together. And we studied things from Dr. Vitolo's website, uh, but they were also giving me feedback and they were talking, they were giving me feedback on my turns, my hairline quality, my rhythm, my spacing, all of those things. And so I felt like I had these little angels watching over me and helping me push my boulder. And then I took a ton of copper plate classes in 2016. I call it my copper plate fever phase. And in June, Paul Antonio came to San Francisco, which is about five, six hour drive from Los Angeles. It's north of, of from me. And I took I took his class. And what something I really liked about Paul was his confidence in his letters. And I was like, wow. I want to, I want to be confident in my letters too. And he was just so knowledgeable about his stuff. I just, I just really enjoyed being in his presence and, and learning, learning from Paul. And then in July, 2016, I attended the I am Peth convention in Portland and uh, Bill Kemp taught a, a copper plate or in grocery script class. And I really liked how he broke down the letters and he was just a very kind and gentle teacher. And I really enjoyed that class. And then in September, Barbara Calzolari came to Berkeley to teach in Grocer Script. And I didn't really know who she was. I was fairly new to, to the world of calligraphy. So I didn't know, I didn't know anything about her, but I, I did hear that she was teaching this thing that I wanted to learn. And so I took her class and I just fell in love with her. I just, I love her so much. So she's great. She's very passionate about, about calligraphy. And she's just, when she talks, you just feel her heart and you're like, oh, I want to be like you too. So I, oh, I just love that about her. I love her so much. And then a few months later, Pat Blair came to Berkeley to teach copper plate and she had a, a different take on copper plate and she had very fine hairlines and she was very soft-spoken and I just really enjoyed that class and so I felt like I really needed to have this experience to have a more wholesome copper plate knowledge I still had a lot to learn but I learned so much from these teachers and probably the hardest working rock pushers anybody could ever ask for oh my gosh I'm gonna start crying okay we might need to take a five minute break but I am so grateful for all of the, the students that I've had Whew, this is not part of what I rehearsed <laughs> so um maybe there's a turn off my camera feature but I am I'm so thankful for all the opportunities to, to share this thing that I freaking love so much. I love it so much, guys. I'm getting these bumps. I, this is my rock, right? And I taught my very first class by accident because I was asked to, because I might've, I might've been dishonest about getting a discount. But anyway, I'm gonna just tell you the story of how I accidentally became a teacher. My first students were my friends, and I just loved this copper plate thing so much that I needed, I couldn't keep it in. I had to share it with somebody. I was like, I was going to burst open. And my kids were too young and not interested. And, you know, 
I was I was itching to share this thing that I loved so much. So in February of 2015, I invited some friends to do some calligraphy with me and I needed to go and buy some supplies. So I went to Continental Art Store, which is just a few miles from where I live. It's closed now, but I went there, I got some supplies, I got inks, I got nibs, I got pen holders, I got papers. And by the time I got to the, the checkout, by the time I was ready to check out, the cashier asked me if I had a discount card to get 10% off. And I said, ooh, I'm buying all of these supplies. How do, I, how do I get my hands on this discount card? And she said, well, you need to be a student, a teacher, or a senior citizen. And I said, oh, oh well, I'm none of those things. And one of my friends who, was, who I was going to teach, she said, what are you talking about? You're a teacher. And I looked at her and I'm like, what? What are, you, what are you talking about? I said, you're a teacher. You're you're about to teach us right now. What do you think you're buying all these supplies for? And I really wanted this 10% discount. So I thought it was going to be harmless. Kind of like when you, you know, you go to Ralph's and they ask you for your phone number or something like that. It doesn't really mean anything. They just, you're just collecting your information, right? So I thought it was harmless. I really did. So I said, yeah, actually I am a teacher. And she said, oh, really? That's great because we're looking for a calligraphy teacher to teach at our art store. And I was like, oh my gosh, what just happened? And I couldn't take it back. I mean, I could have, but you know, it's a discount, guys, a discount. But also I, I was just too ashamed to admit that I had lied, that I was not really a teacher. So I just said, oh, okay, I'm a teacher. And so she gave me her boss's phone number and uh, in March, 2015, I was teaching my first class for the Continental Art Supplies. And luckily I only had two students, but I, and it was a two and a half hour class. And we probably spent the first hour just getting our pen to work and getting the basic strokes. And it was, it was wonderful. And I was so excited about it that I wanted to actually come back because I had learned so much preparing for the thing. I had to create handouts, I had to learn baseline, all of these things. And, and the drills Dr. Gale taught me were actually really useful. And, and that's how I accidentally became a teacher. But it wasn't a thing that I was doing all the time. It was the thing that I was just doing when I was asked to do it. So these are some of my other students. I'm really grateful for all of you. And I wish I'd taken some photos of us during our Zoom classes. Okay, Whew. how's everybody doing? Everybody doing okay? Um, I've, I've had lots of firsts during this journey. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's been a, a really nice way to reflect on the last eight years because I really feel like I haven't done a lot, but when I put it all down on keynote <laughs> it looks like wow I it's it's a it, it's been a pretty eventful journey so I, I picked up a pointed pen at the end of 2014 I discovered copper plate I taught my friends and then I was teaching my class the next month and then I also started a daily calligraphy challenge I hosted with a few of my friends called the hand lettered ABCs and this was really fun for me it really encouraged me to to practice every day, first of all, and to practice with a bunch of people who were as, as excited as me. Again, I, I didn't really have anybody to turn to to share this excitement for calligraphy, but Instagram became that space for me. And so uh, in 2015, I also hosted my first pen meetup, which I host at least once a year. I just pick either a coffee shop or a library or a craft store. And I just say, hey guys, we're gonna meet here, let's come. And sometimes just a couple of people come and sometimes 30 people come. Sometimes we take over boba shops or coffee shops. It's been great. And I, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, in 2016, I started my weekly Q&A session which I'm still doing. We are on Q&A session number 285. So, and I think we're still going to keep going. And in 2016, I had, I caught the Spencerian fever 
and I really wanted to learn Spencerian, but then I had copper plate fever right after that. So I've just, you know, I've just really been excited about calligraphy. And then in 2017, I started my daily quote journal, which I'm still doing, although not really daily anymore, but it's, I'm still doing that. And then in 2017, I also picked up a broad edge pen again. So I was reunited with my first calligraphy love that I forgot. I had actually forgotten all about the broad edge. Um, and I'd forgotten that I had that kit. I had, to, you know, I found it in my bookshelf and I said, whoa, I still have this. I forgot all about this. And then also in 2015, uh, sorry, 17, I hosted my first calligraphy, not really a convention, but it was a calligraphy event that I hosted with some friends and we would do it again for 2018 and 19. And we were going to do it again for 2020, but then we had the pandemic. So we, it's kind of been on hold for now until we can gather our bearings and, and regroup and see if we even want to do that anymore. But Anyway, um, and then in 2018, I was flown to Singapore and um, and Manila to teach, and that was really exciting. I never thought that I would be doing that, and I and I would have returned in. Um, oh, I, I did return in 2019, and I would have come back in 2020, but the pandemic. I feel like that should be. <laughs> I was going to do this, but the pandemic happened. So it feels like that's a thing that we all know too well. And then in 2018, I I went through a, a very life-changing event and my husband and I separated and I, I needed to take my calligraphy a little bit more seriously. Although I was looking for other jobs, I nearly worked at a library because I thought, I like books, I can do this. But I needed to be able to pick up my kids from school, take them to school, help them with their homework, dinner, all of these other things. And I needed something really flexible. And my friend suggested that I teach calligraphy full time. So that's really when I started teaching more actively. Then I started bullet journaling and then the foundational bug bit me towards the end of 2019. And it's biting us all again, 2023. And then in 2020, I was asked to teach some, um, I was asked to teach Gothicized Italic and Fracteur and Black Letter. And I, I kind of sort of been doing it, but I really needed to buckle down and do it. So I had Black Letter fever for the second time. I had it the first time in 2018 when I took a bunch of Fracteur classes, but I didn't really do anything with it. But in 2020, because I was asked to teach, I really needed to learn learn it for real not just copying and um, I needed to learn it at a deeper level and I'm not really sure what happened here I think I took some classes and I taught some classes but I think we can all relate but this part it's like I don't even know if that happened yeah I'm not sure but here we are 2023 and we're still going we're still writing we're still doing drills we're still doing copper plate so this is uh, just the same slide that I showed you a little while ago of my script and how I want to show you here that script grows with us and we're it, and it's influenced by our experiences, life changes, things that we um, and other and other scripts. So here you can see that the study group and the mentorship with Dr. Joe and also starting to teach copper plate in small little chunks really helped me to to learn or to to improve my copper plate and in 2016 this lighter copper plate style was probably influenced by Spencerian which is very light doesn't have a lot of shade and in 2018 or 20 at the end of 2017 I took a class with Giovanni De Faccio and Fracteur and he taught me variations and so I was really curious about, he was teach, talking about fracture variations and I was curious about copper plate variations. And that's when I really started to explore variations. Um, and I was exposed to Stunt Roman in 2019. It was, I don't know how, but uh, so you can see some stunt, I call it stunt copper plate right, for lack of better terms. And then you can tell 
that uh, my black letter fever had some influence on my copper plate here because it's very condensed it's very narrow and there's a lot of texture happening there and I have no idea what happened here that I actually really like like that okay all right so like Wile E. Coyote from Looney Tunes I've had some setbacks with my rock it hasn't always been an easy experience and I feel like sometimes I'm pushing the rock sometimes the rock is pushing me sometimes I'm falling with the rock sometimes the rock hits me Sometimes I just get burned out doing whatever it is that I'm doing. And for me, I think I, I burn out or I, I get frustrated with my rock because I sometimes have this expectation that the journey is a straight, straightforward line. There's no, you know, it's just step one, step two, step three. It's it's this very easy to digest thing but the reality is is different it's messy there's a lot of going back and forth there are a lot of distractions there are, are some breaks that need to be taken there are times where I'm writing feverishly all day long and there are times where I am not writing at all and I need to take a break so uh I think once once I accept reality for what it is and I stop expecting things to go the way that I hoped that they would, it gets a little bit easier to, to push my rock. So the start and finish kind of looks a little bit more like this. This is a little bit more realistic. And look, a squirrel, those are the times we get distracted or maybe we want to go way back and see if we can start from the beginning. Because sometimes we, we don't, necessarily start from the beginning right there really is no beginning the beginning is where is simply where you start um and so along the along the journey I, I experienced some major life changes uh distractions and there are times where I just wanted to start all over and there are times where I wanted to try something new and when I look at it and look at where I start and where I finish or maybe I'm not finished or where I am right now I feel like I did so much but I feel like I haven't really made that much progress and also like Wiley Coyote I I look back on on the things that I've done or the things that I'm doing and I try to see what didn't go well or what can be improved and then I come back with fire and determination and I try new things And so you're probably asking, all right, Nina, enough of this Wiley Coyote stuff. When are you going to talk about the beginner, intermediate, advanced stuff that the flyer said that you would? So I, I've i actually strug struggled. It's not really a good word to say. It, I, I had to battle myself to really think about how I wanted to tell the story because it's it's hard for me to talk about beginner, intermediate, advanced things without kind of telling you where I came from and my beginner stage, my beginner phase. I feel like I'm still in the beginner phase, if we're being honest, and I, I've just near, barely tapped into the intermediate. And maybe sometimes I feel like I can do advanced stuff, but really a lot of the times I'm I'm a beginner. And I think a part of why I keep cycling back to the beginner phase is because I'm teaching and I feel that I'm really privileged to to be able to do that to have an opportunity to revisit the things that I thought I knew but I get to revisit it as my new self you know and uh, with a different perspective with more experience so I get to I get to rework and I get to tinker with copper plate a little bit more and the thing that I learned or knew or thought I knew in 2016, 2015, 2017, when I revisit that now, I see it completely different because I'm not that same person. So I'm, I'm really happy to have that opportunity to revisit those old ideas and that old, old script that I was doing. And uh, I'm really happy to, to be able to improve upon those things as as I go about my journey it's not like I learned copper plate in 2015 and now I'm over it no I'm I'm recycling through copper plate year after year after year 
So how do you define something that is constantly evolving, right? Is the caterpillar a butterfly? Well, not really, but it's going to become one. So couldn't you say that it is, right? Uh, so if you think of yourself as the two-year-old you, right, the two-year-old Nina, and then the 30-year-old Nina, and then the Nina that's going to be 60, that's still all me, isn't it? So how do you, how would I define me? And the, really the only way to define me is maybe to define myself in those stages, but I don't know. Okay, let's try. Okay, let's try to define beginner and advanced and in all of these th things. Let's see if we can simplify them in Venn diagrams because there's nothing like simplifying something um, the way that a Venn diagram does. So I, I would actually classify myself as as a dabbler sometimes, but or it, at least in the beginning, I was that. And these are some of the characteristics of a dabbler. You have wavering enthusiasm. Sometimes you're really into it, although most of the time I was really into it. But sometimes you're like, eh, I'm really gonna, I'm gonna go move on to do something else. Um, and you can usually tell somebody as a dabbler if they have this. Oh my gosh, calligraphy is so easy. If they have that attitude, they're probably uh, just dabbling, and they haven't actually. Um, they haven't dived deep enough to really know whoa there's a lot going on here and there's a lot to learn um something that a beginner and a dabbler share is probably perpetual hopelessness where you just feel like oh I'm not getting any better I've been doing this forever and it's just why aren't my letters the way that I want them what is going on here and then we're easily distracted by shiny objects objects Especially, you know, thanks to the pandemic where there were all of these shiny objects all of a sudden surfacing on the internet and suddenly we're, our attention is divided. But something that differ differentiates a beginner from a dabbler, I think, is the beginner's acknowledgement of the things that they're still lacking, like pen control. Like there really is more to writing than just writing. You, there's more to the pen than just holding it. There's a pen angle. There's applying pressure or not applying pressure. Is you're twisting. A, you know, how are you dipping the ink? What ink are you using? What materials are you using? Um, another thing too that differenti differentiates a beginner from a dabbler is that a beginner has some awareness of that there's some kind of exemplar to be learned or copied. Whereas a dabbler really just wants to write, maybe it's not really, it. and and I don't mean dabbler, I don't mean to, to bash on a dabbler because I'm totally a dabbler in other areas of my life. Um, and I we don't have to talk about that. We could do a different, save that for a different presentation. But uh, a beginner is aware that there's something to be learned and something to be copied. And the beginner kind of slowly realizes that, oh, wow, this is harder than I thought it would be. Um, beginners generally like rules. We like guidelines. We like to know what slant and what size. We want to know all of these things. And um, oftentimes, too, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but some beginners are worried about making mistakes because it's not because we don't, you know, we fear mistakes, but it's because we've just learned all of these rules and uh, we want to follow them. And um, and I think I think that a beginner also has, at least especially in the beginning, beginning is is that unwavering enthusiasm to learn. You get fired up when you know when you don't know something because you want to know that thing that you don't know. Um, and an intermediate calligrapher might be somebody who can look at an exemplar and they can't copy an exemplar but they can choose to use it simply for inspiration or something to look at or but they they can they're they are able to to write their own letters because they've learned it already um an intermediate person might also be able to make up his or her own rules. So instead of writing at 55 degrees for copper plate, maybe he or she wants to write at 60 and she's okay with that or 45 or back slant or, or what other, uh, other variations there are. An intermediate person is fairly confident that they can learn anything. They can learn anything if they just dig deep 
and if they just roll up their sleeves and put in the work. And an intermediate person probably is seeking, and not to say that a beginner doesn't seek this, but that's uh, this is deeper. They really want to form these deeper connections and, and really learn more than just copy an exemplar. They want to understand why the letters are like this. Why is it like that? Why does it look like this? Where did these letters come from? Um, and an advanced person shares something with a dabbler where they can't be bothered with too many rules. This is too many rules, guys. I am going to write without lines. I'm going to make up my own slant. Um, and they get kind of irritated when, when you ask them, oh, that's not copper plate. You're not writing at 55 degree angle. <laughs> and then they're like, it's not copper plate. It's just it's just at a different angle. And uh, I think it's really funny when you speak with, with advanced calligraphers and you question their ways and their methods because some some of it, it's they can't really explain it. It's just their personal preference. So anyway, another thing that advanced calligraphers might be into is, um, is that they're, they're able to make connections and extrapolate new ideas and kind of fuse different concepts or, oh, this thing that I learned from Italic, oh, it's the same thing as this thing that I learned in Spencerian. And you can make those kinds of connections or, hey, I learned this thing in uh, Copperplate. How can I apply that to black letter? I mean, these two things are seemingly opposite, but there's something there still that connects them. Um, and another thing that advanced calligraphers might be able to do is they will be able to compartmentalize different scripts. So let's say you can write copper plate right now, and then in two seconds, you can bust out some Spencerian, or you can bust out some Fracture, and then some Gothicized Italic, and you're able to, to differentiate the two, first of all, but you're able to kind of switch on and off or and or fuse those two together because you know them so well. You don't even have to, you don't need an exemplar really, uh, although you're not ashamed to have them if you have want to look at them for inspiration. But that's the level of compartmentalization that you have is that you're able to jump between two things and separate them or fuse them together seamlessly in a, some new creative way. And this is probably something I really admire about, about advanced people is that they're not overly concerned about making mistakes. If anything, they're, if they make a mistake, they're, they stop and they go, oh, that's cool. Let me try that again. And they'll take that mistake or thing that to a beginner or maybe an intermediate person might think, oh, Oh no, it's ruined and I have to start all over. They'll they'll take this mistake and say, Oh, it's neat. Can I do that again? And um, so anyway, I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I kind of am here, but most of the time I feel like I'm really more over on this side of the Venn diagram. And if there's something beyond advanced, such as mastery or advanced plus, I mean, we have Disney plus, Paramount plus, I mean, we have advanced plus now, right? I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that means. And maybe that's just, I, I have no idea. What do you think about that? Okay, so maybe, maybe if I, if I could be summarized in a Venn diagram, I would look kind of something more like this, this piece here, that's a part dabbler, part beginner, part intermediate. And sometimes maybe I can kind of sort of do some advanced stuff. So uh, is it possible to be all of these things? And another thing is maybe we're, we're constantly fluctuating and swaying and, you know, we're, we can't really be defined by one thing we're we're complex beings who do not fit in a venn diagram okay so let's do some swaying all right so here is the game plan for the next 45 ish minutes we are going to 
to uh, do some of my favorite drills, or maybe at least one. I don't know how much time we have. I want to also show you about time movement. And for those of you who don't know what that is, you're about to find out. I want to also talk to you about the importance of a writing zone and what that is and how you can apply that, not just to copper plate, but to, to any script that you're, you're doing. And uh, at the end of this time, I'll show you some of my, my notebooks, my quote journals, and, and how that's evolved over time. And I encourage you to do something, something similar if you're interested. And at the very, very end, we'll save maybe 10, 15 minutes for, for Q&A. I think that's it. Okay, so that's all. If you want to follow along, you can. You can bring out your supplies. I'm gonna go ahead and set up my camera here while you gather your supplies. Is this a good time for a three minute break, Nina, while people stand up, stretch, grab their stuff? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. All Let's right, we'll come back at 7.48 Central Time. So go grab your stuff, stand up, move around, and we'll be back.
And we're back. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, I have popped up the camera so that you can see here. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about our writing zone. And I'm going to tell you what the writing zone is. The writing zone is basically a space. It's basically the a space on your desk that is the most comfortable, the spot on your desk where your, your hand and arm are resting and most comfortable and ready to write. So for me, when I write, I keep my elbows a little bit off the table. I never write with my elbow fully on the table. It's always poking out just a little bit. And what I do to find my writing zone, well, first, actually, let's back up for just a second. And go ahead and get a blank sheet of paper that's the same. You could probably just pull one out from your, your marker layout paper if that's what you're using. So we'll grab a sheet of paper and grab some washi tape okay some washi tape and you're going to go ahead and tear off two well <laughs> yours will look better than mine but you're going to go ahead and tear off two little pieces and i'm just going to set them aside so maybe about an inch or two centimeters or something like that. You don't need too much. And I'm just gonna set that over there so that I could peel it off later. And the next thing that you're gonna do is take some kind of writing tool. I'm gonna use some... the problem when you have so many pens, you don't know which one to use. <laughs> so I, I think I'll use this pink one. So just take any pen that won't smudge because you're gonna you're gonna put your arm over this so don't use pens that are too um, too watery or that takes time to dry and take your pen and draw a horizontal line across your page and that is too light to see let me change oh so many pens i swear i just need to pick one just pick one Nina. Yeah, pick one okay all right, so we're gonna draw a line across the page like that. And basically what we're doing is we are going to divide our paper into quadrants or into four quarters, uh, well, four quarters, that sounds a little redundant, but so once you've divided your paper into these four quadrants, we are going to label them. I'm just gonna start here on the top right quadrant. I'm gonna label that one. And I'm just gonna go counterclockwise and label it two, three, and four. Then I'm gonna close my marker and then I'm going to take my tapes and I'm going to place a tape here on the side of the first quadrant and another one here on the side of my fourth quadrant. And then what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna clear my desk, make sure it's, there's nothing there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take, oh, I guess I'll just use this again. I'm gonna take my writing, actually, sorry, back up again. We're gonna take this piece of paper, we're gonna turn it upside down so that the sticky parts of the tape are face up so they don't stick to anything. And we are gonna just set that aside for the moment, and now I want you to work on your sitting position at your desk. So for me, I am sitting right here. This is me. And again, when I write, I keep my elbows off the table just a little bit. And what I want you to do is I want you to take your hands. You have two hands. You have your writing hand and your non-writing hand. and your non-writing hand has a job. Your non-writing hand, in the Spencerian books, the, the authors call this the serving hand. So your non-writing hand is going to grab a sheet of paper. And I'm not sure if it was shared, but 
uh, I did share some some guide sheets and some handouts, but it, you don't really need that for this demo. So maybe even if you don't have it, don't worry. Just use any line sheet that you have or any guideline that you that you have. So when you're writing with writing copper plate, usually you don't write with your paper in this orientation. Usually you'd have to turn your paper a little bit. And depending on let me lower the uh, depending on whether you're writing with an oblique holder or a straight holder, the angle of your paper might be different. So if you are writing with a straight holder, here is a straight holder. Your paper angle might be more like this. Let me zoom in. It's because you want your nib to be in alignment with your slant lines. If you are writing with an oblique pen holder, your paper will be turned a little less, which is one of the advantages of using an oblique holder versus a straight pen holder. So now my, I don't know if you could see that slant line, but my, you can see that my pen is parallel to my slant line. So usually when you're writing with a pointed pen, you want to align the nib, the length of your nib with the slant at which you are writing. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, I'm gonna demo with this for now so that we you could see what I'm doing. And oops, let me zoom out. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out where that comfortable writing position is. And now that we've we've established a slant, let me grab my ruler. So I'm gonna draw this slant line so we can see it because it's kind of, it's too light. Okay, so that is my slant line, which for copper plate is 55 degrees. And what I want you to do is I just want you to practice just in the air without actually writing on your sheet, practice finger movement. So this is finger movement. Finger movement is defined by this extension of your fingers and the contraction of your fingers. So your fingers naturally want to make a straight line. And if you're using a straight pen holder, you want to align your pen with your slant so that when you're pulling a, a straight stroke, you're already on the slant. You're not fighting, you're, you're not writing like this and fight, you know, making a stroke this way. First off, because uh, first off, your, your pen won't make a shade because you're in order for your tines to open, uh, it needs to be parallel to the direction that you're pulling it. But anyway, sorry guys, I don't want to turn this into a copper plate class. All right, so um, when you are writing, you use your serving hand or non-writing hand to move your paper as you write, kind of like a typewriter where the type is just being punched onto the paper at the same place, right? It's like this, and it's the paper that moves as you're typing. So we're gonna do the same thing with our paper when we write. We're going to use our non-writing hand to move the paper because if you don't move your paper and let's say, at this point of the paper, you are making straight strokes. Right, now my pen's not working. And it's probably okay for the first couple of strokes you're on the slant, but as you move your hand across the page, the natural finger movement of your hand, uh, you, you start to, your, your strokes begin to take on a new slant. So you might have started at 55, but then by the end of it, you're at 40 degrees. So in order to, to keep your, your stroke, your straight strokes on the slant, you make a, one or two or three strokes, and then you move your paper like a typewriter. And this keeps you on the slant, so you don't have to really think about whether you're on the slant or not, especially if you're not using slant lines. You can just move your paper until you get to the edge, and then you bring it back. So go ahead and practice this for a little bit. Make sure you're on the slant. And if you're not on the slant making the stroke, maybe your strokes are more upright, turn your paper a little bit more. And if you're too slanted, then turn your paper the other way. So just keep playing with your paper until you find that sweet spot where you can use finger movement and maintain a pretty good slant. So, for me, that's here. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to drop everything that I'm doing. I'm going to hold my pen the way that I am that's comfortable. And with my serving hand, I'm going to grab that piece of paper that we 
we numbered and we added washi tape to, at the ends of. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lift my writing hand above the table, maybe about an inch or two. And I'm gonna slip this sheet underneath my writing hand until my writing hand is in quadrant two. And once my writing hand is in quadrant two, I'm gonna place my paper down and you can't see it, but I'm gonna make sure that the edge of my, this sheet that has the numbers on it is in alignment with the, the baseline or the horizontal lines of my paper. Okay, so once I, establish that then I'm going to secure the paper on the table see it probably but I'm just going to press on the tape to secure the the paper onto the table so that it doesn't move okay so what's just happened is that you've established your writing zone um so I'm sitting over here but my arm is here when I'm writing and by taping the sheet here it keeps me from swiping my arm across the table, first of all. And second of all, it protects my paper from me touching it with my fingers. So for those of you who know, if you touch your paper with your fingers and say you just ate a cheeseburger or your hands are not clean or they've got some kind of natural oils on them and you touch your paper, it ruins the paper and it keeps the ink from adhering properly to the paper. So you'll have some kind of bald spot or something like that. Okay, so um, the thing about finding this writing zone, we'll just put a W, Z here. That's your writing zone. Is that it might it might change. Maybe as you write, you find a more comfortable position, and you can reposition it to be either more slanted or closer or further. So this is not really a thing that's permanently attached to your desk forever. It's a thing that changes with you. Maybe you go and get some water, and you come back, but your writing zone is different because you readjusted your seat you're not sitting in the same position or you're turned a little bit more to the left or a little bit more to the right so this writing zone is is changing with you and you have to just find that that sweet spot for you so for me I'm going to move mine a little bit more so here and you can also use this for broad edge so let's say you're writing with a broad edge so this is a pilot parallel pen and let's say I'm writing fracture and if I have my writing zone, this is, I won't naturally want to make straight strokes like this. Okay, but uh, maybe it's a little bit too slanted, so I'm going to turn it even more. So you can adjust, you can use the writing zone for broad edge scripts as well, not just pointed pen. You just, uh, you would just need to turn, turn your writing zone sheet. To, to accommodate that other script. So anyway, this is the arrangement that I have. And so when I'm writing copper plate or Spencerian, my paper is at this angle and I'm holding my pen like this. And usually I use my non-writing hand to pull my paper. And usually I'm pulling along the edge here. I'm trying not to touch the paper or sometimes I'll move it up here from the top. But as much as possible, I try to avoid touching the actual surface of my paper. So this is your writing zone sheet. It's also acting as your guard sheet. And for those of you who practice broad edge on, on a slant board, you're probably accustomed to having some kind of guard sheet taped to your slant board, right? So this is really no different, if only it's open on one side so that you can move your paper. And when you get to the edge of this the table and you've got this little flap sticking out, uh, I would avoid folding this downward and instead when I get to when I'm writing at the very top or something I got this little flap here I just fold it towards me and so it's just resting against my my abdomen here as I'm writing so that's just one little tip if you don't know what to do with this part okay so this is my writing angle I'm actually going to turn my camera this way and I'm going to lower you down Oh, hold on, hold on a second. Let me let me show you one more thing before I do that. I mentioned finger movement when you're writing, but there's also some slight wrist movement. So wrist movement does this swipe, kind of like a windshield wiper motion. 
And then there's a third kind of movement that we use for copper plate called forearm movement or muscular movement. And muscular movement is where you have this fleshy part of your arm, your forearm, and it's, it's just rolling on the table. It's, it's resting on the table and it can roll side to side. It can be pushed up and down. It can roll in a circle. This is combined movement. And so when you're writing copper plate, you're never really just writing with only your fingers or your wrist. It's a combined effort of fingers, the wrist, and the forearm. They're all working together. So if I zoom out and I'm writing, this is probably what you'll see. So I'm, I'm never just writing a letter. Oops. Let me get some ink. I'm never solely writing with just my fingers unless I'm writing really, really small letters. So if I'm writing a capital, for instance, or a flourished letter, I am using some fingers and some wrist, and I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see it. But I'm also doing this with my forearm. And I lift whenever I need to. I have nothing against lifting mid-stroke and continuing. So I hope maybe you're able to see some finger and some really minor wrist movement and some forearm action. So that together is called combined movement. Now I'm gonna remove you from my little stand and let's, let's do, let's, Take a closer look at tine movement and what tine movement is. I need to get you in there really close to see this. So up close and personal. Okay, so I'm gonna take a paper towel and if you have ink on your pen, go ahead and blot that out. I'm going to clean my pen because I want to demonstrate the movement of my tie. So to clear off the ink, I just dab, I just remove as much of the ink as I can with a paper towel. And then I'll, once I've gotten most of the ink off, then I'll dip it in my clean water and then I'll, I'll wipe it again. So I never dip a loaded, loaded nib in the water because that's going to give me dirty water really fast. And that's a technique I learned from Mike Ward, who teaches ornamental penmanship. Okay, so time movement. Um, to do this little demo, take a ruler and take also some kind of pen. And well, if you already have slant lines, then that's good. I'm just going to make mine a little bit darker so it's easier to see. And I think I'm going to demo with a pen that's actually not that good. It's a little worn out because I don't want to ruin this, this one. This one's still pretty new. So I'm going to set that one aside and I'm going to use this pen instead. So if you have a brand new nib, be careful or else you might uh, accidentally <laughs> break your, your brand new nib. So the first thing that you want to do when you're writing copper plate, as I mentioned before, is you want to make sure that your pen is in alignment with your paper. And you know already that my paper is on a slant. I'm actually over here but I had I turned my camera so that you can see it like this. Okay, so place your pen on that line that you just made. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. Place your pen and you can twist your pen to the left and to the right. And I, I probably should mention how to hold the pen. This is a conventional hold where you let the pen rest on your middle finger and then you take your index finger and your thumb and you just kind of clamp it in this three with your three fingers. Okay, and you just hold it lightly. You're not gripping it tightly. It's just it's just there and you're holding it and maybe 
For me, I'm holding it against this knuckle. Some people hold it above the knuckle. Some people hold it below the knuckle. It's really up to you where you hold it. And depending on how you hold it, your pen might be more upright or it might be lower to the paper. And there are advantages to holding it one way or the other. But uh, in this case, I don't know which way I hold it. Sometimes I, I just go with the flow. I don't really think too much. So zooming back in, what I want you to do now is I want you to take a look at your pen and I want you to place your pen along that line that you made, that slant line. My slant line is 55 degrees. That's the standard slant for copper plate. So place your pen there and go ahead and twist it in your fingers a little bit. And if you kind of, if you aim to, to place your pen that and you, you place it in a flat way, meaning it's not turned to the left or to the right, and you apply pressure, well, let me get that here, and you apply pressure, if your pen is not turned to either side and you apply pressure, both of your tines will split open evenly. So if you place your pen, apply pressure, and you're not twisting your pen either way, it's going to open both tines. The left tine is going to spread to the left, and the right tine is going to spread to the right. If you twist your pen to the left, and you place your pen on that, that line, and you apply pressure, the left tine will stay on the line, and the right tine will glide open to the right. We don't want this to happen. So what we want to do is it's probably best for a beginner to hold it flat, but I think that um, our aim is to hold your pen so that it's slightly twisted to the right. So it's not flat, slightly twisted to the right, and then place your pen on that red line and then apply pressure and see what happens. Okay, so if your pen was slightly canted or turned to the right, what should have happened is that the right tine pierces the paper and the left tine glides open. So what's actually really happening is that you are flexing the right, let me see if I can zoom in even closer. Okay, let's see, let's focus. Okay, what's actually happening is this. You are flexing the right tine. The right tine is bending and the left tine is relaxed. When you apply pressure, and this is what's happening. Okay, but maybe a little bit more subtle. It looks probably looks more like this. But that's what's happening is that when you flex or apply pressure, it's the right tine, look how it's bending, that's pretty cool. Okay, so this is important to know in, in copper plate because, um, because, 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 because you can separate, you can separate your strokes into, into, um, you can separate, yeah, you can separate your strokes into one, movement, and two, pressure. Okay, uh, again, I'm using a really old pen so I can flex this all I want until it breaks because it's this is my demo pen. So be careful if you're doing this with yours, okay? So uh, a normal, uh, here are some, some strokes or these are the parent strokes for copper plate. Just like any script, you have your oval and you have your straight stroke. So this is my straight stroke for copper plate gonna touch that up because it's not very good but you also have your oval stroke it's hard to write with this nib because it's it is old and I I definitely 
apply a lot of pressure on it. But anyway, I've already done it. So here we go. These are the two parent strokes for copper plate. And if you, if, it, if they didn't have any ink in them, it would look like this. So the straight stroke would look something like that, where it's just a parallelogram, a really long one. You have two straight sides and two, two parallel sides here and two parallel sides at the top and bottom. So when you're making the stroke, you would actually begin the stroke here at the top. You would place your pen up here. You would apply pressure and then you would pull down. Maybe I'll do this in different colors so it's easy to see. Okay, so to make a straight stroke, you'd place your pen here at the top corner you would apply pressure and then you would pull down. And then by the time you got to the end of that stroke, you would release pressure and the right tine would snap shut to the left because it's flexed, right? The right tine is flexed. Whoops, it's stuck to my paper. It's flexed. And when I, because it's flexed and the left one is relaxed, when I release pressure, the right tine snaps shut and you get a squared top and a squared bottom. There's a little bit more nuance than just that, but uh, we don't have a whole lot of time to, to, to do that. Um, anyway, going back to, to separating the stroke into movement and pressure, what, what does that mean? So if we take a look at this parent stroke, this oval, and let's take a look at it, it looks something like this. right? You can probably notice that the outer curve, the outer oval, is different from the inner oval. So the inner oval is, is this shape. It's not fully oval like this outer one. It's got a flatter side here on the left and a fuller curve on the right, unlike the outer oval where it's equally curved on both sides. You see that? So what we can do is we can separate those two ovals. Okay, we are gonna separate the inner ovals, it has a slightly flatter inside and a curvier right side. And then you have this outer one here, which I'm gonna do in blue and then it goes up around. So they're sharing. At this point on this upstroke, these two strokes are, these two tines are together. The tines are closed for this one. Okay. So when you are making this kind of a stroke, you know, and you're making this mindfully and you're really studying the stroke and really being one with the stroke, right? To, to get the stroke down, you must be the stroke. Um, so we could think of this, this pink line as the movement. So when I'm moving my pen, I am actually making this stroke. I'm not actually making the oval. My pen movement is flat on the downstroke and curvy on the upstroke. And that is because this curve of this oval is taken care of by the shade. So when this is the movement. And when I apply pressure, the left tine takes care of that curve. But meanwhile, my hand or my finger is moving kind of pretty straight downward. There's only a slight curve here. And it's the pressure that takes care of that curve. So um, when you are writing copper plate letters, this is a really big letter. Maybe I'll write a little bit smaller because this X height is too big. When you're writing copper plate, you want to make you want to be careful of, of how you make your oval. So your oval should not look like that, where the inner oval is the true oval. But really what you want is you want the true oval to be on the outer side. So now this this shape is, is um, if it was hollow, it would look like this. 
where it looks like it just had a big lunch and it's poking out on the left side. We don't, we don't want this. Instead, what you want is you want this sort of deformed oval on the inside. This is your movement. And when you apply pressure, it takes care of the true oval form. So you want your oval to look like this. You see how it's slightly straight on one on the inner side and more curved on the outside. Whereas this one is curved inside and outside. But this is what you this is what you're aiming for. And And if you if you see all of the basic strokes and you think of them on if you separate the strokes in terms of movement, how is my pen moving? And at which which part of the stroke is, is taken care of by the pressure, then maybe maybe this this is too too deep. How's how's everybody doing? That makes sense. Um, we have, we're going to spend maybe 10 to 15 more minutes. Um, so I, I've just, we're just swaying back and forth here and there. We're not really spending a whole lot of time anywhere. Uh, but let's do some more basic strokes and then I'll show you my, my favorite drill that you can maybe practice tonight or tomorrow or for the next eight years. So here we go. Here are the basic strokes. Uh, I already told you about the mama stro stroke and the papa stroke, the straight and the oval. So if we take a look at the straight, this is your straight stroke, and then you have your oval stroke. And the thing about copper plate script is that it's a modular script, meaning that you could take these basic pieces and you can put them back put them together in a different order or a different way to create a new piece so this is a straight stroke and this is your oval stroke and this is this oval stroke with the shading on the left side you can also have an oval stroke with the shade on the right side so this is called a reversed oval where the shade is on the right side. And this is just called, a, you could just call it an oval, or sometimes it's called a direct oval. So direct oval or indirect oval or reversed oval or just to know, there's so many names. It doesn't really matter too much. We only name things so we can talk about them. So you could just call this whatever you want. <laughs> okay, so these are the two parent strokes. And we have three other main strokes, uh, or basic strokes, and they are the underturn. And the underturn is basically a, it's half straight stroke and half of the bottom of the direct oval stroke. Okay, so that's the bottom part of this. And so you, you get the underturn. And to get the overturn, we're gonna take the top part of this indirect oval and we're going to attach it to a straight stroke. And with copper plate, just like italic or, yeah, just like italic, you want all of your shades to be parallel to each other. So this is your overturn. And then um, the third basic stroke is a combination of the underturn and the overturn. Some people call that a compound curve. Other people call it a double turn. To me, it's all the same. So 
we're going to start with the top part of an indirect oval. And we're going to attach that to the bottom part of a direct oval. Okay. And because all of these strokes, so this is a, a, a double turn. Because all of these strokes are part of a circle, guess what? Now I'm trying to find another pen, right? Too many to choose from the paradox of choices. Uh, so because all of these strokes have an oval, it's gonna share the same width as the oval. So let's just call that one unit. So the distance between the shade and the hairline or the end of that stroke is also one unit. Same thing for here and same thing for there and here because it's, it's part of the oval. Okay, now I'm gonna show you my favorite drill. So my favorite drill, we're going to, I'm gonna zoom in. And we're gonna need two lines for this drill for our X height. So we have the baseline at the bottom and the waistline at the top. And what we're going to do is we are going to alternate between the oval, the direct oval, and the underturn. Direct oval, underturn, oval, underturn. So here we go. I'm using my good pen now. And actually, if you if you want to, to take this one step back, you might start with an oval and then just placing another oval next to it. Now, when it comes to, to placing a stroke next to copper plate uh, for copper plate um, letters, you want to avoid overlapping. So if I'm not careful and I place my next stroke here, what's happened is that I've just overlap the first stroke with my second stroke so that you can't see the whole oval anymore. This part of the oval here is, is missing, it's gone. So practice just placing ovals next to each other. And, you know, maybe for a few, for a few tries, they might not connect at all. They might not join at all. So just keep practicing until your ovals are just ever so slightly kissing at a single point like that. And of course, also if you're new to pointed pen, your ovals might take on different shapes. It might be round sometimes, sometimes it might be triangular or wobbly or really narrow or really wide. So it's important to take some time to really get that oval and you might have to make a few wrong ones first. So, but eventually if you do it enough times and if you do it with awareness and concentration, you'll get it right. I am living proof that it's possible to, to get the oval. You just have to do drills for a long time, but okay. So once you get your ovals down, you can now move on to the drill that I intended to show you in the first place, which is oval. And then that underturn, oval. So this is certainly gonna count for my drills for 2023, I think. What do you think? So if anybody asks if I've done my drills, you are, you can vouch for me. And remember to move your paper as you go and try to maintain that oval distance between your straight strokes. Move your paper as you go and avoid overlapping your strokes and keep your strokes on the 55 degree slant. And when you run out of ink, that's called railroading. Okay, so 
there you go. That is my favorite drill. And I don't usually warm up anymore because I I just go straight to it. I feel like my writing is is the warm up, but you know, when I haven't written copper plate in a while, this is usually my first drill. And if you go, if you're on Instagram and you go to Anand Tran Bootcamp or Copper Plate Drills, you will probably find all of these, all of these, um, uh, lots of drills, actually. And if you have the Speedball textbook, I do share some drills in here. So here on the Speedball 25th edition on page 59, I share some drills here, but I've got tons of them also on Instagram or and you can just follow what other people have been posting. So here are some of some other drills. And of course, I just showed you a whole presentation full of drills. So, um, but this is definitely my my number one, my number one drill. Oh, great, Georgia, I'm glad. Awesome, Tico. Okay, so I have probably just a few more minutes before we go into Q&A, and I just want to show you a little bit of the quote journals that I was talking about earlier. So I have a story to tell about the first one. I might need to actually pop you up higher or I could just move the camera. Okay, so this is, I might turn myself this way. Sorry, take you dizzy. This is a, a notebook that I, I received from my friend Kirby. And she gave this to me in 20, 2017. She went to Japan and she, at the time, she owned a stationery shop in Hong Kong. And so she was collecting stationery or testing them out. And she sent this to me. And at that time, I was the type of person to really feel like I wasn't worthy of having nice things. I, you know... She might not have thought this, and this is just a notebook, but to me, it was so precious. I couldn't possibly write on it. But she, she asked me a couple of times, so Nita, notebook that I sent you, how's, is it good? Do you like the paper? And again, she owned a stationery shop, so she was really curious about the quality of the, the paper and um, my review of it. And so I, I just took a die, I, for the first time, in my life, I actually took something that was a present and I, I wrote on it. So I, I wrote on it simply just to get her to stop asking me. <laughs> so I wrote on it and I said, Kirby, I wrote on it. It was great. And then that was it. And I thought, well, I've already messed it up. <laughs> I've already messed it up. And I've always just been fascinated with quotes. So I just started writing quotes on it. And these are some of the early pages. Of, from my notebook and I'm going to flip through these pretty quickly and um, there's going to come a point and you can see I, I mess up all the time I miss words I cross out lines I'm not really thinking about it and in part because I had really no plan to share with anybody and it's only now that I've, I've completed it and I can look at it from a different vantage point that I'm comfortable sharing it without cringy too much because I know that this was a part of my process and I, I just kept writing every day I didn't skip a day and interestingly I really enjoyed it I enjoyed having a thing to do where I can keep my quotes every day and then there's a shift I don't know if you saw it maybe I flipped too quickly but from here oops that's not from here to here, there's a shift. I don't know if you see, maybe not. But my my writing changed. I'm using a different 
um, a different ratio, my ascenders got smaller. And then if I keep going, there's another change. Suddenly I've got borders. And it took me with quote number 63, it took me 63 days to get to this because at first I was haphazardly just doing it, not really caring if I had smears or, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to fiddle with the brightness. But it, I, I want to, I'm, I'm showing this to you to point out that it takes time to make progress, especially if you have no idea what you're doing and you're just doing it for fun or just to, to tell your friend that you, you did it. But it, it, I had to sit down and do it for 63 straight days to make progress. And I actually began to feel like wow, I'm getting this copper plate thing. I think this is the point where I stopped feeling so much like a beginner. Like I was kind of passing the intermediate zone a little bit. And so I just kept going and, and it just goes on until the end. And I loved it so much that I did it again. This time, this was a notebook given to me by Dr. Gail Madalag, my, her, the first person that I stalked, <laughs> my, my first mentor. and. Again, I she gave it to me, but I didn't want to write on it because it was too precious. But I said, you know what? I finished my first notebook ever in my whole life. I've never finished anything ever before. And I felt really confident that I could do it again. So I did it again. And this time I, I tried different things. I wanted to practice different things that I was learning. I took N. Davenis's class and she was doing this so I did a little bit of that and whatever it was that came to me or was a part of my day here I'm writing with white ink um I just I just did it and and after a while uh, I don't know how much time we have I'll just flip through it this way I finished another notebook and I was so pleased with myself that I did it again and this time I just I just let myself write whatever was going to come out of me. And I, I was just happy. It was like a passport. I was just happy to get something on there and move on. And it didn't have to be perfect or anything like that, which was something that I really struggled with. So I had two notebooks and I've had, well, now I have three of these other ones. Some of them are work in progress. This one is a completely different notebook. I'll show you that in a minute. But this one here was a part of my, what's this one? Was a part of my 100 days of copper plate challenge with, which I do, um, I host 100 days of copper plate challenge. I think <laughs> it feels like every other year. Um, but this was a part of it and it's my notebook. And here I'm definitely doing different things. And so I encourage you to also keep well, if you don't want to use a notebook, that's okay. I prefer really thin ones because then I can finish them real fast. And also when you write on them, there's not this huge lump of paper that you need to, to rest your wrist awkwardly on. So Lina, would you mind yes. just real quick? Uh, we had some requests because everyone's loving looking at that. If just maybe slowing down a little bit on a oh, few of the pages, okay. just because yeah. uh, that way the camera can focus a little bit on it. But I know okay. as you flip through it quickly. Oh, yeah. Some simpler anyways but part of it's just the fun of getting to see the whole oh movement. okay thank you for telling me yeah. these aren't very good that's why I was going fast so you wouldn't see them jeez you are these books it. lined or oh yes rooted? this is this is a graph graph sheet maybe I'll Zoom in. Oh, now I see. I saw it came into focus just for a second there. This is more experimental stuff. Thank you. That looks great. You're welcome. Thank you for looking or thank you for wanting to look. So this is something that I continue doing and 
And I also do it for black letter. So it's not just copper plate. This is more upright copper plate, a little bubbly. It's so cute. Then we go back to narrow, which I really love, with short ascenders and descenders. This one has a little bit of a Roman minuscule feel to it, probably because of the E's and the Y. I'm just trying different things. I don't really necessarily like everything that I'm making, but and then you just try writing without guides and just try writing in a circle and turning your paper. So it's it's not it's not perfect or anything like that by any means. But I'm writing every day and each day I find something new or I go back to something that's old that I really like. This is uh, I've removed the entry strokes and the exits exit strokes and it looks kind of like a very rounded italic, which is what copper plate is derived from anyway. So there you go. I did a little bit more of that. Here's one with a back slant. And here's one where I'm trying a bunch of different things. I really like it when they're narrow and compressed like this. And then I tried also monoline and just highlighting the little dots. And in this one, I just chose random strokes to highlight or to shade and I kept the other ones as a hairline just, just to see what would happen. And I'll show you one more. And this one I tried to I tried to practice copper plate with my left hand. So this is my right hand at the top and my left hand at the bottom. Because I wanted to be able to help my left-handed students. Um, I'm, I'm still working on my left hand. He's got a lot of He's got a lot of work to do, but he's he's doing pretty good, I think. Not too shabby. And this is just earlier this year. Good job, left hand. Look at you go. So proud of you. Um, and I used to really be afraid of bleeding and feathering, and now I love it. I think it just, it adds something to it. And more left hand. And then I completely abandoned my left hand <laughs> to, I, I needed to, to do other things, but I, I guess I did do a bit more. I really like this back slanted script. And I think getting towards the end, what I really want to show you is some more variation. This is Spencerian. Um, so. The things that I've learned with black letter, I just do it to copper plate and see what happens. So in black letter, we often do exercises where we use a, a broad, like a six millimeter pen and then a two millimeter pen and you alternate. And I thought, oh, what would happen with a pen? So it's not like I'm creating anything new really. I'm just taking stuff that I learned from other places and applying it to something that I already know. People like this upright copper plate. Really, really narrow copper plate. Back slanted copper plate. And chunky copper plate. I think, I think that's it. But um, 
are there any questions or uh how are we how are we on time you're right at 8 44. you're right on so time. yeah okay well awesome then um then i guess that's it so Patty, do you want to lead a Q&A session and then close us out for this section before we do our sneak peek for Saturday? Yes, yes. Are there any questions? Actually, I have one. <laughs> okay. If I might be so bold. Are you still in that little study group with the other two people? Oh, no, I, I'm not. And not because, uh, not because I, I left or life happened with my other friends and uh, my friend, my friends um, took a, a very long break from calligraphy and, and I'm not sure they're coming back. So of the three of us, I'm the last, I'm the last one standing. Oh. But we, do, we, do still, we do still chat, but our text messages now have, you know, we talk about cake. <laughs> and, oh, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah we talk about everyday life stuff. Not it served not, its purpose at that moment, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, and I, I really felt like I was the weak link. So I'm, I'm surprised that I was, I'm still here. Wonder. Good question. Thank you. Do you have all those quotes in your head, or do you have a book of quotes next to you? <laughs> Oh, um, okay. I'm going to show you something, but you can't judge me. <laughs> you can't? Promise me. You have to swear <laughs> it somewhere. <laughs> okay. So on Instagram, I follow a lot of quote, a lot of people, you know, um, I like to read about philosophy and psychology and things like that. So I, I tend to save quotes and um I have things I have on my Instagram this is maybe private but it's okay I've already shared I've already shared too much so you know how you can save you can save things on on Instagram well I save I save things that I save uh, quotes to write tips about raising my children or I really want to, I really want to learn Japanese and Chinese calligraphy at some point. So maybe in the next 10 years, I can try that, but I just save a bunch of quotes. And so at any point, if I want to, I'll just, because I'm saving them when I'm scrolling mindlessly, sometimes I allow myself to do that. And I'll just, I just have a bunch to, to look at. So at any point I can just look very quickly and, you know, I could just, look and and see so I I'm kind of saving them on my downtime and then when it comes time to when it comes time to to write it's all on my phone or oftentimes I'm reading something so I'm I'm reading something and I it's it's really hard for me to read because I feel like I have to stop every page to write something right so here's an example I picked up this book and I started reading it this month and I ha I've only I'm so embarrassed I've only gotten to page 17 because as I'm reading I want to write something already <laughs> so I'm highlighting and I'm thinking oh, I need to I need to write that and I have to grab a piece of paper and I need to write it and then I turn the page and then there's something else that I want to write and so sometimes as I'm reading it's really annoying but because it takes me a year to read a book I'll take a notebook and I'll start. Um, so this is my notes from, from reading this book. As I'm reading, I'm just writing. So I have to, I see it, I need to pause. I write it I, and then I go back to reading and then I read something else and I read something. And then I have to stop and I have to write. And it's, it takes me for, I think I read a page a day no maybe a paragraph a day because they spend much more time writing so that's unbelievable 
That's like reading and pushing a rock at the same time. Then <laughs> yes. I felt that. Yes. And I was like, exactly, exactly oh. that. Yeah. That's funny. Gosh. Are there any other questions? Um, okay, well, I'll, if there aren't any other questions, I'll just show you very quickly another way that I keep a notebook. This is just something that I got from a Japanese stationery store, or not really, it's Daiso. And it's just this bit of paper, and I just keep my notes in it from, from classes that I take. So I I used to, well, I still do practice on loose leaf, but there's something about, no. I really like notebooks. And I think it's it works for me because I'm a mom and I don't have to worry about where I keep things and loose leaves and binding. So I just keep all of my notes in this oh notebook. But they're, but they're related, you know? So this is all pressure release kind of, uh, notes. So I would have a different stack of note. I would have a, this one, I was a bit ambitious and I wanted to bind my black letter practice, which I never got around to. So I got all of this black letter it, it's just waiting to be to be bound so i've kind of learned my lesson not to to do that and just to write a notebook so yeah if you don't know what else you, you could buy all sizes of notebooks and this happens to be perfect for what i'm what i'm doing and i get distracted all the time because i want to start uh, you know, I'm taking a class with Jurgen, but I have to pause him because I want to write something else. And so it takes me a month to to take probably a two hour class because I'm pausing all the time to write my own stuff. So I, I never it takes me forever to 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 do anything really. But OK, um, if there are no questions, then I'll go ahead and pass the baton back to Anne. Well, we're gonna, do you wanna come off of your um, document camera and come back so we can see you? Sure, I might look all sweaty, so I'm, I'm really sorry. That's okay. Um, and then uh, back to Patty, Patricia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, wow, Nina, I talk about hitting it out of the park. <laughs> I'm like, um, I'm, I'm totally inspired. Yay! I've, I've studied calligraphy, but I've never gotten to pointed pen and I've never seen that demonstrated. I was just like, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, thank you. Um, I'm getting back to it. But this was to me also a celebration of discipline. I, I, I love drills, but my, I haven't had a time to get back into that in my life. So, uh, wow, so much to think about. But um, I actually, uh, but when you were demonstrating, I'm thinking, I wish the whole world would get back to basics <laughs> and, you know, you know, kind of appreciate, you know, the foundations of stuff, you know, it just feels like everything is surfacy and fast and because we do have so many choices, but um, we I, yeah, we do, we do. And it's, I mean, I'm not trying to make it sound bad, but um, no, no, no. We're, 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 we've departed so much from what makes us tick um, as far as seeing the progress and feeling the growth and, 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 and you know what, learning the patience, really, yeah. it, the patience, it, I think that's, that's the thing I miss, you know, and I want, I want to get back to it, but that's why I asked you about your accountability partner, because I uh -huh. kind of need that to get in that kicked off, so I, I loved your uh, tracing your, your, your teachers and your growth, so thank you. Yeah, you know, you can find an accountability partner anywhere, <laughs> you just ask somebody who is as passionate as you and they will join you. They will. Um, you can have a Padlet group. You can start one. You can have a Facebook group. You can just, you know what? Do it yourself because it, when you do it yourself too, you get to go at your own pace. But sometimes having that that accountability partner really helps too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just because you know that you, you just don't let yourself off the hook that yeah. easy. I mean, Especially you know, when you see them little... working. Yeah, when you see them working and you're slacking, you're like, oh, okay, I, I need to get to work. Guilt and competition always, <laughs> unfortunately, are so effective, right? Yeah, it, it's a good, the good kind. No, I know, I know, I know. But anyways, I'd see in your journey, I, I, I love it. I just, I love your, um, your, your just passion, but your steadiness. You're so very steady. 
in your in your passion i you just it seems to me what, you know, the two things that calligraphy needs, you know, as a combination. Yeah. I, I was telling you earlier that it's because I I have to teach. I have to. I love to teach copper plate that I'm constantly being brought back to the basics. Mm -hmm. And because I have students who are so are brave, I'm not the type to. I had a question. Yeah, <laughs> I, never, I never do that. I'm like, gosh, I hope somebody will ask this question. Right, right, right. I'm over here. I don't know the answer. But uh, I learn a lot from my students because they have questions. And I think that because they are asking me questions, I think I need to have an answer. Or they they make me think about things that I I never really thought of before. Yeah. Or, hmm, that is interesting. I never thought of that. So it's because I'm teaching. I feel like I have that advantage to keep going back to the basics, back to the basics. And uh, I, don't, I just don't get tired of, of it. And you're around open minds and um, you, they, the students give to you. It's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. How that works. Un, unintended consequence, right? Yeah. Jeez. Wow. Oh. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tricia, for finding Nina for us. And uh, Nina, thank you so much for <laughs> sharing, so much. sharing your focus, your dedication, your talent, your time, your journey. Um, I think a lot of us worry that we're never good enough. I know I do. I'm constantly, mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And I think part of your journey is the realization that good enough is today and tomorrow will be something different. Yeah. And that's okay, right? because we're on this journey and I think the other realization is that if you ever want to learn anything make sure that you teach it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so it's like man it gotta learn it right yeah so thank you so much Nina um it's been delightful I have posted your handouts are in the chat uh so People, please go and grab those so you can practice and uh, you can hear Nina's voice in the back of your brain. Um, <laughs> this evening has been recorded and uh, we will be uploading that uh, to our YouTube channel in probably be Sunday. Um, so uh, we will email everybody that attended tonight. Yes, we've been taking attendance. Um, and we'll email you the link to the video so that uh, you can uh, go through it again and maybe go through it slowly. And it's going to be a two hour lecture. It's going to take you, you know, 40 hours to get through <laughs> stopping it and taking yeah. notes in the style. So um, we've got two things left to do tonight. Um, let's have a quick look. I don't think that's the right file. Is that the right file? Are you seeing Saturday schedule? Yes. Oh, very good. Okay. Um, quick look at what we're doing tomorrow. So the Zoom room is going to open up at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, big cup of coffee, central time. Um, and we're going to have our breakout rooms. So if you haven't worked with breakout rooms and you didn't attend the tech check last night, please be there at 8.30 so that we can help you learn how to go from your table to table in our virtual conference room, right? Um, Sally Whitekin is doing two uh, lessons with us today, tomorrow on calligraphy with everyday tools. It's like a calligraphy scavenger hunt. The two classes are independent. You don't have to attend number one to do number two. You can just show up for number two, show up for number one, do both of them, um, and uh, you will enjoy it. Patricia is doing a delightful presentation on artist trading cards, and uh, we liked what she was laying, laying out so much. We said, can you do it twice? Because <laughs> It's really cool. And if you don't have an art trading card practice, you need to get one. And Patricia's got great advice. And we have a system in place that you can start participating in something. I'm doing a revisit of Cuthbert Unschul, which I taught back in March. So jump in, come spend an hour doing some broad edge work. And then Lynn Lacey 
I heard about this and I was like, and then I saw what she does. Loved it so much, it's on the schedule twice. Um, it's just a great way of reinterpreting your art, your calligraphy, your love of texture. Uh, and what she does is absolutely amazing with how she stitches um, letters onto paper. So um, this is a presentation and uh, you, she has samples of her work and she'll take you through it. Um, so that's everything in the blue breakout room, the lapis lazuli breakout room. At the same time, simultaneously together, at the same time, we have a class on painting an acanthus leaf twist. We're going to talk about how do you draw or paint straight lines without making blotches or having bad things happen to you. Uh, Lynn is back <laughs> with her stitching on paper. Jean Formo is uh, just gracing us with her world famous making it yours, copying a manuscript alphabet. If you plan to attend this class tomorrow and you do not have the handouts from me, you need to get them tonight so you can print them out because she runs a very tight ship. And when that class starts at one o'clock central time, you need to be ready to go boom. Okay, so there's no running around for 12 minutes faffing, getting handouts. You need to get those files from me tonight. And then Patty's back with uh, trading cards in the afternoon. If none of these float your boat or you just want to attend two or three of the things and the rest of them, you're like, eh, not worried about that. Join people in the Boon Siena room, which is our scribal hangout area. Show and share, talk to people, see what they're doing, get some tips. And if a class is running long, we're going to boot you into the scriptorium as well. Uh, if you meet somebody in the class and you go, oh, I'd like to hang out with that person, say, hey, do you want to join me for lunch in the Burnt Sienna room? And you guys can have a chit chat there as well. All right. We're going to wrap up at five o'clock with a happy hour. So bring your beverage of choice. I think mine's going to be a huge cup of coffee. And we're going to talk about what did you learn? What surprised you? What was amazing? What do you want to learn more of? And then at six o'clock, um, our president, who's going to talk to us now, um, she'll do a thanks and close us out. So it's a long day. It's a busy day. It's a jam-packed day. Uh, if you haven't bought your pass, you need to buy your pass. And uh, if you haven't gotten, if you've bought a pass and you haven't gotten your Zoom link, go look at the email because it's a two-step registration process. So if anybody's bewildered, if anybody's confused, email me workshops at colleaguesofcalligraphy.com or send me a message here in chat. Um, it's going to be a great day with a variety. We've started tonight out strong with pointed pen. Tomorrow we're going to do some chisel edge work. We're going to analyze chisel edge. We're going to get our paintbrushes out. We're going to get our needles out. We've got our trading cards ready to pop in the mail. We've got a lot going on. So do join us. Uh, we look forward to having you. Zoom room opens 8.30 tomorrow morning, Central Time. And we are starting these classes at 9 o'clock sharp. So be there or be square. And, and we so, did have a couple of questions in the chat too about yes. the handouts for um, the other classes. And I know you mentioned some of those instructors will be share, popping those in those, that day. Yes, all of those instructors, you don't need the handout to do the class. So those instructors are giving you handouts um, at the beginning of the class and you can have them, you can look at them afterwards. Maybe my cancer's class, it might be useful to be there bright and early at like 8.45 and I'll give you the handouts then. It's just a one-page handout. And if you have it up on a second monitor, that's fine too. You don't have to print it out. Um, 
So those people that are telling me they need the handouts, yes, I will get them for Jean's class. I will um, pop them in the chat to you here very shortly. Any other questions, Annalise, that I missed? That was the main one was the handouts one. So yeah. Hey, I can read chat. So on that note, our um, colleagues of calligraphy president, Colleen, um, she's going to close us out here this evening. So Colleen, if you want to come off of mute, there we go. Oh my goodness. I don't know what I can add other than a huge thank you to Anne and Patricia for organizing this. Um, Nina, certainly for the presentation that you have offered to us. Um, as a, a person who loves Venn diagrams, I thought that your description of beginner, advanced, intermediate, and whatever else was brilliant. And then the scribble. Um, I think we all could relate to that. Annalise, I want to thank you for being our tech host. Things went very smoothly this evening. I know there was a lot of prep that went into that. And I thank you all. Um, Nina, I want to encourage you to pursue Chinese calligraphy. There are a few of us in the guild who have tried that. And it's a very different exercise working with a brush. Um, I, I have nothing more to add other than to say, I hope to see many of you tomorrow in the workshops that we have planned. Um, and thank you again to Anne and Patricia and others in the colleagues who have planned this um, first annual Maker University. I think it's, it is the first and we expect that we will have um, more in years to come. So have a good evening, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, Colleen. Thanks everybody. I have put links into chat to the people who asked me for Jean's handouts. If you haven't got it, please shout now or email me. Um, if anybody wants to just hang out and chat, you're more than welcome to because it's kind of fun to have everybody together. But I do know it's after nine o'clock and some of us have an early morning <laughs> and we have a busy day ahead of us too. So... I will go All ahead right. and stop the recording at this point. And then that way, if anyone else just has any questions they need to shoot in before, then we can, we'll say, I'll leave the meeting open just a few more minutes for that. Um, but Nina, I had a question for you. Um, did you learn that um, inside oval from another teacher or did you think of it yourself? Uh, I... I learned it on my own, but I learned about time movements from from my study group. And in the mm. can I share can I share my screen? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. Um, Mary, did you get the link from me now? Just pop it, put in chat. I think I've sent it to you twice now. All right, keep going then, Nina. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, and I'll do the recording on just a minute longer than while Nina's answering this question. <laughs> that's okay. That's good. Uh, okay, so you remember that website that I shared with you from Dr. Vicholo, the zonarian.com? If you go there, well, first off, I'm going to show you this awesome link. You go here at the top, and it's going to show you a list of uh it's going to have a list of of penmen american penmen and it's going to show you i'll just click on one and if you click on it it's going to show you a, an example of their exemplar of their letters so that's a a great resource is to go to dr bicholo's website and go to the lessons link here at the top and you can access all of these things um but i'm, I'm what i want to show you is this resource here if you scroll down to additional resources and you go to dreaming and script online um actually sorry the one the second one which is the same this is 
also the same website, but a different uh, page. If you go to the Moss Grimes Archive of American Penmanship, is that it? No, wait, hold on. Um, I think I need to go higher. Where is it? Is it here? Does anybody? Oh, the Zenarian Manual. Oh, gosh, sorry, guys. The third one. <laughs> but all of these websites are still good. But if you go to the Zenarian Manual one, you can download this free book for your personal use. And it's going to show you in this book. And share another screen. So this is what the book looks like, which I have a, a PDF copy of. And when you scroll down, you can, or flip through the page, you will see a, a little demo here of the time movement. Okay, so you'll see how the time works. And it just so happened that in my class, Again, my students are asking me questions, and um, I don't, I don't really know that I've seen that anywhere else about the the you know separating the stroke into the movement part and the shaded part. But I did derive that idea from this idea that well, that you can manipulate or you can control the tines, you know. So that's that's where I got this idea from, and this is a great book for learning um, a very formal style of copper plate called engrosser script. So check it out. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes. I just thought that that was brilliant to see that oval inside <laughs> that, that um, it just gives you a really good way to look at it. And other teachers don't teach it that way. And I just think it's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any last questions? And I have seen, I've had have had people recommend that manual, but I think you have to work in copper plate a little bit to appreciate it. So I think now if I go back to that manual now, I think I'll appreciate it more than when it was first, you know, recommended to me. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that it's it's hard to appreciate it right from the beginning because you need to have some context first to make sense of what's happening. So it, it took me a while to appreciate the Zenarian manual. As you know, I, I dismissed a lot of that stuff. I was like, I just want to write, you know, not really thinking too much about it or wanting to think too much about it. So I the more that I do, the more I appreciate that manual and other books as well. Well, thank you so much, Nina. I'm going to go ahead and I'll stop the recording now. But and if anyone else has any questions um, for Ann and I for tomorrow's meeting, uh, you can feel free to pop them in the chat. And like I said, I'll leave the meeting open just about five more minutes or so just to make sure we catch any last, wait a minute, where do I go? Or any of that for tomorrow. And other than that, like Ann said, we'll be here bright and early tomorrow to open that Zoom room. So you can bring those same questions then if you've already bought your pass. Uh, and anything else before I stop the recording?